Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of In the Spotlight of Mike Kenichi. Um, real happy tonight because if you were a fan of Head of the Class like I was in the 80s, I mean, it was one of the best shows that ever existed, and we watched it every Wednesday night. And I'm proud to announce one of the main core of that group is with us tonight, and he's been around TV since the early 80s. Um, I can remember an episode of him on Sane Elsewhere, which we'll get to. Cool. He's been on uh, Keenan and Kel, where he was the lovable Chris Potter. Um, but we will always affectionately remember him as Arvid on the popular sitcom, Head of the Class. It is my, it is my honor to introduce to you the one and only Dan Frischman. And Dan, I want to thank you for coming on today. It's a real honor for me. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that lovely uh, introduction. Hello. So, Dan, um, a lot of people may not know this about you, but you're quite the mu quite the magician. I mean, when you were younger, you uh, developed an interest in uh, magic simply by uh, seeing an ad in a Boy's Life magazine about, <laughs> uh, you know, magic and stuff. And that's really how the love for that begins. So talk about that a little bit. Yes, I, I remember I got a uh, a book one one book booklet was called One Thousand and One Things You Can Get for Free, and they you would just send away for um, stickers and and they, they were all like promotional things for Exxon and or Esso at the time, and and uh, and I loved getting I just loved seeing my name when I was six seven years old on an envelope coming to me, uh, and then also in the same Boys Life magazine they had a magic catalog. And uh, a little gimmick to become a ventriloquist, throw your voice into a box. And so I got all those things and started ordering magic tricks. And, uh, and I took a liking to it. I, I, my, I have two older brothers who were Cub Scouts. And we went to um, where well, they had these Cub Scout blue and gold dinners. And they had a magician performing at one. Uh, Fred Kolb was his name from uh, Birdsville, New Jersey. He was also a uh, uh, a history teacher at, I think, Bernardsville High. And he did a show, I think, with his son, and I just was enthralled by it. And I wanted to know how everything was done. And I went up and I think I just asked his son how everything was done afterwards. And I was like, I must have been, uh, you know, six or seven. I thought maybe he would take pity on the little and just tell me, but of course he wouldn't. So I started getting books from the library about how to do magic tricks because I was, I was hooked. And then by the time I was eight, I felt ready to do a show, which I did for uh, a bunch of six-year-olds, neighborhood kids. Uh, Kenny Ward up the street was having his birthday party. Of course, my tricks weren't that sophisticated, and all the kids were yelling. The uh, one kid in particular was yelling all the secrets to the tricks. Uh, and I thought, okay, I can't do this. But Mrs. Ward gave me $3 for my efforts. And I went, wow, I can make money doing this. So I continued on and uh and then of course eventually got better tricks and begged uh any adult i could uh to take me to a mad any magic store or they, you know they didn't have they had catalogs but they didn't have anything online there was no online to speak of of course so i but i very slowly started building a a repertoire until i had a better magic show and then started doing regular right. magic shows and dan you know like anything else when we're kids there's different things we want to do if we hear uh, you know, I'll use as an example, Bon Jovi or Journey on the radio. We want to be in a band. I mean, we get pumped up for it. We want to do that. If we see a, an actor on TV or a show we like or a film we like, we want to do that. And it's the same thing with like magic and stuff like that. When you see things on TV, if you see like, you know, a movie where a guy's performing a magic trick, stuff like that, you, you say to yourself, you want to do it. But, you know, a lot of times, sometimes those dreams aren't always realistic when you're a young kid but the fact that you were able to do it at such a young age and you still do it today i'm pretty sure correct oh i still do i i just now it's a a fun hobby uh, i'll do charity events and now i have a a grandson who just turned six i'll do a magic show for his uh his party so uh yeah i i, I still i still enjoy it and have fun with it right so let me ask you dan um what um what like at a as a young kid, I mean, it's not easy doing magic. I mean, you really, you could do card tricks. You could try to do, you know, make people disappear, but it's hard to do. Where were some of the tricks that you did at those shows for those kids when you were a young kid? Boy, I remember um, I had a couple simple tricks. One was the, a ball and tube trick where 
you'd show a metal tube and a, and a ball bearing that could not fit into the tube. But, and, and then you'd pass it around and no one could fit that ball bearing into the metal tube because it was too big to fit into. But the magician would take it and wave his hand and the ball would just kind of melt into the tube and then it would melt back up and you take it and make it disappear. And then boom, it appears back on the tube. And then, uh, and then you pass it out again and no one else, and no one can put the ball in the. I remember that particular one. And I actually got that one uh, at Macy's in New York. There used to be uh, on the fourth floor, a, 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 a guy, a magician who's had a, his own counter and he would sell magic tricks. Yeah. Uh, and then it was that one. There was... Um, a Svengali deck, deck, excuse me, that was originally called, oh, there's later called TV Magic Cards when Marshall Brodeen, professional magician, sold them on television. Yeah. But I had that one. And uh, but yeah, so those were the some, some of the simple tricks I, I had. And, oh, some story tricks. There is um, a story of a rabbit who disappears and appears on a, he ends up reappearing on the birthday boy's back, that sort of thing. And I imagine, Dan, that your parents had to be very supportive of this because in order to do this stuff, they had to get you the proper things that you would need. So, I mean, at a young age, your parents were very um, supportive of you doing this. They were. Yes. Thank you. My my uh, I remember my mother took me to my first magic shop. Uh, it was, I think it was called Top, Top Hat Magic in, in New Jersey. Red Bank, New Jersey. I remember going to this magic store. And then finally... Um, Either they or my, I had an uncle in New York City, Uncle Al, took me uh, to Tannen's Magic Shop in Times Square, 1540 Broadway, 17th floor. I remember walking into this giant shop and were, as far as the eye could see, were just magic tricks and magic tricks and shelves and rabbits and flower. I just, I couldn't believe such a place existed. It was like, you know, a five-year-old walking into a fudge shop and just go, I can't believe So... Um, that became uh, my mecca. That was my mecca of magic. And I would try to get there whenever I could. And I got to know the owners, Lou and Irv Tannen and Tony Spina. Magicians would know these names. Uh, and uh, that, yeah, that became my place for, for a good while. Right. I loved going there and, and they'd, they'd show tricks and then they'd, you know, they'd sell them to you. So let me ask you, Dan, um, we'll get to head of the senior class, which you've been doing on YouTube. But have you ever thought about putting your magic out there on YouTube and doing something like that? Because I bet a lot of people would love that, especially young kids. I mean, kids to this day still love magic tricks. I mean, they'll still do card tricks and stuff like that. So I think it'd be something that people would really enjoy. Yes. Well, in addition to uh, what you just mentioned, uh, head of the senior class dot com, yeah. uh, I have Houdini dot com uh, spelled like uh, Houdini, H-O-U, but with Danny. So it's H-O-U-D-A-N-N-Y. Right. Dot com. And if you go there, it, it takes you to a, a YouTube site where I have about 14 um, different oh. videos with magic tricks on it. That's uh, so that was that was kind of my COVID era project. Uh, and people keep asking me, well, when are you going to put more on? Uh, but I'm now on to this other project of the head of the senior class. So I'm I've kind of put that on hold for the moment. Right. Well, it's I'm going to check it out and I hope people will as well, though, because I mean, seems like you're really quite the magician as good of an actor as you are this is like a hidden talent that we you know are learning about that you've been doing since you were a little kid so that's really cool oh thanks mike yeah i appreciate it I, and, and i i love doing it i'm a, I'm a lifetime member of uh this yeah place called the magic castle in los angeles and um uh, and i love going to see shows and right so dan it. let me ask you um in addition to being you know having a love for magic how did the love for acting begin for you? I mean, did was there anybody on TV that you really enjoyed watching or a show or a film that made you say, you know what, I want to get into this? You know, I think it was so innate in me that when I was in the kindergarten circus uh, playing a lion tamer, uh, which was the only time that I was in school with my brother, my elder brother, Bill, my eldest brother, because Bill was like five years old above me. So I was in kindergarten. He was in fifth grade. So it was the only time we were in school. So the kindergarten circus, before they actually do the show on the, on the, on the stage in the school, we'd all do a parade around uh, a circle uh, outside. And so my brother was there with his friends. And anytime I would pass by, uh, they'd go, hooray for the lion tamer. Woo! They'd like cheer for me. Yeah. And to me, 
that they were adults. I mean, <laughs> those were the those were the big kids, and they were accepting me while I, it, it was the only time that ever happened uh, yeah. because I was playing a character. I was playing a, a role, and then I did the show, and I had fun doing the doing the playing the lion tamer. I guess I was the ringmaster as well. I'm not quite clear on that, but um, but I think I was hooked right from that moment on. And I would always want to be in the school plays. In fourth grade, I wrote uh, our like I wrote three short plays that ended up being our our class play that right. year. Um, hey. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. That's all. That's was all I gonna say. Yeah. So I was. It was just innate. It was like already a uh, built in. But that um, kindergarten circus was the, kind of the the light that went off. And I know you've been an acting coach, Dan, but let me ask you, did you go to an acting school? I mean, did you take acting classes? I mean, talk about that a little bit. Yes, I, uh, I went to Penn State University uh, just for equivalent of two years. I finished uh, two years and a year and a half because I knew that uh, I wanted to be an actor uh, really badly. So, um, and you know, they were not hiring at Penn State University. Uh, so I went to, I started out in New York at, um, I was doing stand up comedy uh, on the Upper East Side of New York City, a club called the Comic Strip. But then uh, uh, during the day, I was taking acting classes at a place called uh, HB Studios in Greenwich Village, uh, Herbert Berghoff Studios. Um, I wasn't as serious about that as, as I was about the stand up at that time. So I took lessons again after I got out to Los Angeles uh, with a wonderful teacher, retired now, named Daryl Hickman, who yeah. was uh, also a child actor in, in his day. His, uh, he and his brother uh, uh, equal roles in different shows. His brother, Dwayne, was best known as Dobie Gillis, an old show called yeah. Dobie Gillis. Yeah. Uh, but Daryl did, uh, did many movies, Tea and Sympathy. Uh, he played Henry... Fonda's little brother in the Grapes of Wrath movie. Uh, so he was uh, well known as a child actor back then. And um, yeah, so he's he was my teacher for a good five years or so. Yeah. And Dan, a lot of people I talked to over the years who have taken acting classes, the one thing that seems to always be similar about all of them is when they're taking the class, they talk about the different instructors and what they've meant to them and stuff like that. But also that the, the the acting coaches didn't take any nonsense. And what I mean by that is if an acting coach saw you yawn and he would say, okay, leave, you know, they didn't want, I'm sure that's not for everybody. Like not everybody went through that experience, but I know a few people I had on my show, you know, Al Sepienza comes to mind. He had told okay. me how uh, his acting coach basically saw somebody yawning and he said, okay, you're not interested, leave. So, you know, now he gave him another chance to come back, you know, in a couple of days, but he made it clear that if you're going to take these classes, you're going to be serious about this. So, I mean, did you find any similar things with that that you went through? Uh, I think I know who Al, Al's uh, teacher was. I'm not, <laughs> not going to say his name, but um, like Daryl, for instance, was just a kind man and you wanted to do well. Yeah. Um, he would get annoyed if you wanted to. Um, I think I, the only time he got annoyed is if I asked him if I could give him a check the next day instead of the day that I was due. And he, he he didn't even get angry or tell me to leave. He's just like, he just kind of became annoyed with me that if yeah. you're, that if you're serious about this, you pay the check on the day you're supposed to pay the check. And you know what? He was right. Um, other than that, I, I think we were all uh, good boys and girls and just wanted to show up. And, and we were very into what uh, the teaching was and into what Daryl was, was saying. Um, I think the class that Al was in had like 60, 70 people in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but I think for the most part, teachers are not um, egomaniacs, but there are some who will, you know, who will say if you, you know, if you're not, if you, if you look like your attitude is wrong, either change it or, you know, or get out. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just not, uh, I don't think the best way to teach, frankly. Now, Dan, um, the first time I remember you coming onto the scene and, it was one of, <laughs> it was a classic episode. It was an episode of the Facts of Life. I think you played the character Rocky. And it's funny because I think Natalie's, or Mindy's character, Natalie, is mad at Blair. So she's trying to purposely set her up with a nerd. And she sets Blair up with Rocky, which was so funny. I mean, the whole episode, you were great in that episode. Oh, and, you. you know, I remember years later, like I said, when I would see you on the head of the class, I always remember that Facts of Life episode. But let me ask you, did you do anything prior to that Facts of Life episode? Uh, yes. Um, 
I was, yeah, like Rocky was my uh, the nickname for Carl Pizza Face Price. <laughs> yeah, Pizza Face. Yeah. Yeah, they call him Rocky Price or Pizza Face Price. They put acne on my face, and makeup to make me look like one of the undesirables. Uh, but my first role was actually maybe a year and a half before that on um, a show called It's a Living. Yes. Uh, Great also show. called Making a Living. Uh, I think it was called Making a Living when I did it. They switched back and forth. Uh, but Ann Jillian was on it and Louise Lasser. Yeah. Um, and and really terrific, terrific actors and such. Uh, and so I was on that. Paul Kreppel played, is a, is a good friend of mine. He played uh, the smarmy piano player. Um, Marion Mercer and Barry Youngfellow. Anyway, I, I just had like one line on the show and my lines that got such a big laugh that they brought me back again uh, a couple more times. And because of that, I was able to get a tape. And back, back then there's no, you know, there's no digitized anything. You have yeah. these big old honker video, three quarter inch videotapes you would take around. Uh, but because of that tape, I was able to get uh, a, 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 an agent who then, then sent me out on other parts and I started and th they sent me out on the facts of life uh, episode. Yeah. And the thing is too, Dan, these guest stars, you know, these guest spots, even though they may be a one-time thing or maybe a couple times thing, if you leave a lasting impression, you're going to always be remembered on there. You know, I had, um, uh, God, her name's escaping me. It'll come. Oh, Kathy, uh, Podwell on my show. And, she had uh, been known for Dallas, but she made one memorable episode on the series Growing Pains where she was singing that She's a Brick House with that funny voice. And people to this day still sing that song like that. And she was only on that one episode. Oh, uh, yeah. The yeah, same yeah, is yeah. true with you playing uh, Pizza Face on Facts of Life because to this day, I mean, when they bring up pa Facts of Life or they show that clip, it, over the years it's been on and off YouTube and you'll see the comments in the section and granted you've always been known as Arvid which we'll get to but people on those comments just kept saying love pizza face Rocky's the man you know stuff like that so it's amazing how you don't realize when you're just doing these guest spots what the impact you will have you know years later well thanks and it was about two years ago they did uh, facts of life live um on a, I think it was on ABC, and and they did that episode, and John Stewart played my part, and they even put a wig on on his head that looked like my hair. <laughs> uh, so that was a, a lovely homage. Yeah, and now you know I just talked about having one memorable guest spot that could last forever. Well, I, I alluded to this early on, but a show that I love and still love to this day, I could watch reruns all the time. Is Saint Elsewhere, just a classic show. And I will never forget the episode that you were in. You're sitting with the doctors no. in the cafeteria and you're not saying a word. You haven't said one word. They're all talking. They're all complaining about their lives, this and that. And then they just happened to say, they whispered or like, who is this guy next to us? Where did he come from? And I think you were like a technician or something like that. You were yeah, I must have been an intern, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But you're just sitting there and you didn't even have to say a word in that episode. And to this day, people still remember that. They still look back on that. Oh, so, I mean, that's you. what I mean about you, Dan, is anything you seem to be in, you kind of leave this, like, you've got Arvid at head of the class. you got Pizza Face, Facts of the Life. you got that episode saying elsewhere where you don't even have a name, but people always laugh at that scene where you just sit there and they're all complaining and you're just observing. So, I mean, yeah. those, I mean, that had to be pretty cool, even though you didn't get any lines in that episode to just sit there and kind of just be there had to be really cool oh it, it really was because i was a big fan of the show it was maybe at that time one of my top three favorite shows uh so when i was cast as this intern who just i it, it, the idea is that i was sitting at the table before anybody got there but i'm sitting by myself at this giant round table so all the other doctors come and, and start sitting at the table and as each one sits down they look at me and goes they go hello and i'm and i'm too shy to say anything so yeah. i just like that and uh uh, and then there's a bit at the end where they, they try to get information out of me, but cause, uh, something has gone on at the table that they weren't privy to. Um, but I was excited about that because I got to, it, it was like having a really good seat <laughs> for a scene yeah. from that show. I was sitting at the table. I just get to watch these, all these actors, these fabulous actors, uh, like Ed Begley Jr. And David Morris, uh, uh, all those people oh. do, um, do, yeah. do the scene. And I'm just like, I just got to sit there and watch. It was great. Yeah, it really was. And, you know, that was a classic show, like you said. I mean, it was tremendous. I mean, just 
unbelievable writing. I mean, the actors were great. I mean, William Daniels to me can act as good as anybody. He's phenomenal. So yes. I, when you get to just be in one episode with an assembled cast like that, which such talented people, Norman Lloyd, who lived to be 106 years old before he passed away. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just amazing that, you know, you got to just, even if you were in one episode, to say you were in an episode with all those actors had to be cool. Yes, it really, it, it really was. Uh, uh, and, and, and Howie Mandel at that time was a, 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 a friendly acquaintance of mine. Uh, so we didn't get to work on it. He wasn't at that table, <laughs> that table, yes. but I did hang with him a bit on the show as well. Yeah, and it's amazing to think of the actors from that show, how big they would be later. Oh, yeah, Denzel on. Washington, I forgot to mention. <laughs> I'm yeah. sitting next to, I was sitting next to Denzel Washington. Yeah. Was, uh, he became uh, very big. David yeah. Moore became very big. I mean, and then, I mean, of course, like the, the three main, you know, senior doctors, uh, Daniels, Norman Lloyd, and uh, Ed Flanders, those guys oh, yeah. all were just phenomenal actors. Yes. So, I mean, just tremendous cast. TV. Tremendous cast, yeah. Right. So, Dan, this is what I've always heard about uh, head of the class. You had to kind of lie about your age to get the part. And I believe you were 27, 28 at the time. But you told the uh, producer you were 22. And I think, <laughs> didn't you say to him, would you have hired me if you knew my age? And he said something funny. So tell that story a little bit. Yeah, true that. Um, when I went in for the audition, I, I was in the audition late in the going. I think originally the producers and casting were looking for actual 14 and 15 year olds to fill those parts. But the way I heard it is they couldn't find uh, the kind of talent they were looking for amongst that group. So they started looking at us, you know, I was, even at that time, I'd done a bunch of guest spots. So, you know, I was maybe a veteran actor at that time. And they thought of, they thought of me. And when I went in, uh, Mindy Marin, the casting director looked at me and she goes, eh, you could do this. I think she knew that I was, you know, that I was way beyond the teenage years. Uh, and and I was 27. And uh, I just knew that I was, I probably have to lie when I went into the, uh, went into the uh, audition for the director and producers. Uh, and I, there, and, I, and, and, and indeed, that was the first thing they asked me. I walked in, they said, how old are you? And I said, 22. And the reason I didn't say I was a teenager is because I thought I could get away with 22. Right. And 22 would be okay. Uh, and it was, uh, and then like you mentioned that it was, uh, we had had a, we had a big party at a restaurant in the Valley, uh, for the hundredth episode of the show. So by this time I felt like my job was fairly well intact. Uh, I was pretty confident <laughs> they weren't going to fire me by that time. Uh, and I asked one of the producers, I mean, they, they all knew how, how old I was. And I, by that time, they, even just from medical, you know, for medical thing, you have to write down the actual information. Uh, and I said, I asked, I said, would you have hired me if I told you I was 27? And Michael Elias, one of the two exec producer creators said, well, let, let me put it this way. We never asked you again. Yeah. Which so, is, no is the answer. No, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's pretty much what he's saying. And you know, what's crazy about it, Dan, is nowadays, and I mean, even in the nineties and I'm sure in the eighties as well, you know, Michael J. Fox was supposed to be 17 years old. He was like 23 at the time. Most of the time, high, the kids they get for high school shows are usually in their twenties, but it's very rare when somebody's pushing 30 to be in a high school show. So let me ask you, was it weird, like being 27 years old and now you're in high school again? I mean, it has to be a little bizarre. I know you're doing the TV show, but you got to yeah. kind of be a kid again. So that that could be a little of an adjustment. Well, you know, I didn't really think of the age so much as I just thought of the character, which and I'd done a lot of comedy improv. Um, for, for years, I had just been, you know, when I wasn't working, I was doing comedy improvisation at the, at the comedy store or little clubs around Los Angeles. And so I had played that character so many times already that when I went in for the audition, as I already had it in my hip pocket, I just kind of just did what I have done, had done already done for years. Um, so I just, even though I was 27, I would just think, okay, girls, grades, acne, go. And, you know, and I had a baby face. So, so uh, I, I, I didn't really have a problem playing younger. You know, I, I suppose if I went to a, a shrink and, you know, we could figure out ways where it may have stunted my actual growth <laughs> playing a yeah. high school student and having a teacher and, you know, being back in high school. But other than that, I, you know, I had an easy time playing playing Arvid. Uh, you know, the challenge every week was just really 
how to get the biggest laugh out of whatever they were going to give me that week. And for something that was like your first big break in TV where you're on a series and you're a regular, and I'm sure this was for a lot of the cast members, to be able to work with somebody like Howard, who had established himself as a tremendous actor, you know, WKRP yeah. in Cincinnati. I was a fan. I was a fan. Yeah. So the fact that you got to work with him, and I loved the, the whole sequence and how the show was built because – Everybody in that class, they were considered geniuses in a lot of ways. They were the upper group and they had their own room because they were all the honor roll students. Yeah. Yeah. They were all they were above everybody else. I mean, I, I think that um I think what's her face was she was the only actual kid on that show. She was probably twelve. Oh, Tannis, Tannis Valley, yeah. who who played Janice, was actually yeah. thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. So she was thirteen, but just the show was so much fun. And I mean the fact that most of the time you guys stayed in that classroom, that was the show, similar to Welcome Back, Potter, but, you know, an updated yeah. version. And it was just yeah. so much fun. And the chemistry that your character had with the Dennis character was phenomenal. And I love that mouse episode where you guys can't seem to find a mouse. Something's yeah, happening. Yeah, science both, project, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I think you both think that the other one took his mouse or whatever it is. It's one of those classic episodes. But when you think about it, Dan, you know, you've always kind of, in my opinion, got a little, you're, as an actor, they'll kind of, when they do your bio and stuff, they'll say, you know, he played a lot of characters. Geeks that and were, nerds, but, yes. But, but you know what gets me is anybody that's ever played a nerd is always the coolest character on the show. And when you think about uh, head of the class, to this day, if you ask most people, the most popular character for them was Arvid. I mean, it really was. So, I mean, to be able to play that part, play it so well, and that you're pretty much the character that people loved on that show. They liked everybody, but they really loved your character. It has to be a tremendous feeling and accomplishment for you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks, Mike. I, uh, yeah, I, I tried to build uh, humanity, uh, humanity into him, and um, so that he wasn't just a, a you know a cartoon nerd. It would be it would be very difficult, I think. Uh, for myself and the audience to watch a cartoon nerd uh, every week. Um, at that time, I was pretty recognizable on it from a you know a network show. Uh, so I remember, you never know where a nice compliment is is going to come from that can really kind of um, cement things for you. I was in a, was in a local at our local supermarket, uh, and I was reading the magazines as I was always want to do before I, I was you know I'd put down my Carton. You there? I think I lost you for a second. Let's see if we could get you back. I think we lost him briefly. We'll see if uh, we could get Dan back. He froze on us for a second. So we'll see if um, he could get back up. You know, one of the things, folks, like I tell you with technology is the thing that's so frustrating sometimes is it doesn't always want to cooperate. And he froze for a second. Um, but I'm sure he'll get back up. He'll, you know, reboot it or whatever. Um, but as you're listening to Dan, you know, I, I brought up the Arvid character and how special he was and how important he was to that show. And I mean, he really was. I mean, in a lot of ways, he, you know, just so many fans loved him. They really did. So in that sense, it was so much fun just having him on. And uh, I'm sure we'll get Dan back on, folks. Sometimes these things happen. It's the beauty of technology, as you know. It could be good. It could be bad. I struggle with it sometimes. And it could be frustrating. But uh, Head of the Class was really a popular show. I believe it was on Wednesday nights, if I recall. Might even been on Tuesday to start, but eventually it went to Wednesday nights. And I mean, just think about the cast of characters. You had Robin Givens, Eric Roberts, you know, Dan. I mean, so many, Howard Hesserman. You had so many people that were so instrumental on that show who just did a wonderful job and uh, really made that show what it was and made it successful. And I think it was on five or six years, but it was a big hit for a ABC. It was just tremendous. And uh, Dan was a big part of that. I mean, he really was. And, uh, just hoping we could get Dan back on because this was going really well. And it's always a shame when this happens and, you know, something happens with the technology aspect of things. So I really hope we could get him back on. I'm sure he could reboot. You know, that's all he has to do is uh, just try to sign on again. Uh, 
I mentioned, you know, that Facts of Life episode where he played a Rocky, you know, pizza face. It's just a great episode. Uh, as I mentioned, the character, Natalie, she really got mad at Blair and she wanted to get back at her. So she sets her up with this, you know, guy who's, as you, as um, Dan mentioned, they, they had him have all these, this act. Okay. I think we got him back. Now what happened? <laughs> yeah. It, you froze for a second. It happens. Sometimes the wi fis just don't um, cooperate. But the thing I was saying to you, Dan, I think we were talking about um, people really, you know, just fell in love with that show. I mean, it was a tremendous show. I was talking to people just a second ago um, when uh, we got cut off. I was talking about how you had Robin Givens on there, Eric Roberts, you had uh, Howard, you know, just so many talented people on that show who went on to do great things after. Right. Brian, but Brian the, Robbins, who I think. Or is Brian Robbins. Yeah, 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 I said there, yeah. And Brian was just tremendous. I mean, he he was always like, he kind of looked like that cool kid, but he would always stick up for the people in that class all the time. Yeah. So I, it was like a family. And I'm sure like being able to have those five, six years with those people had to be very rewarding for you, not only as an actor, but as a human being. I think so. Yeah, those were those those were my people. We uh, we hung out. I hung out. At first, we, we would all uh, en masse go to a restaurant together. But then, then, of course, everybody finds their little cliques. And I, I hung mostly with uh, Dan and Brian, Dan Snyder and, and yeah. Robbins. But we uh, but I, I, I'm also friends with uh, a lot of the others. So uh, even as late as a week and a half ago. I got together with five or six of uh, of the cast members uh, at Dan's house, and uh, I hope to to uh, have another reunion where we get a lot more people together. Right. So, Dan, after the fourth season, Howard decided to leave. I think uh, ABC had canceled the show, and you guys went that final year in syndication. Um, uh, I, I believe so, right? Weren't you, it wasn't the last season, maybe in syndication. No, no, uh, no. It we, was we, ABC. Okay. We did all we did all five seasons. Um, Howard was actually let go from the show, um, and they made it look like you know sound like he decided to leave, but um, he didn't like the show, and he made no bones about it, and uh, he tried to get our producers fired, uh, which didn't work, and they in the end were able to uh, turn the tables, uh, and and. Uh, have him be the one to be let go because also because they, our ratings were dropping at the end of the fourth season. Yeah. And there may have been talk of us being a winter replacement or being canceled, but uh, our two exec producers got this wild idea. Hey, why don't we replace the teacher? And they went into network and said, and said that so much as much uh, pitched the idea and they went, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's kind of what happened there. I mean, uh, it was difficult yeah. for you guys as a cast. Now, I know you at that at that point, you were 30 years old. But I mean, was it difficult to lose somebody that you'd worked with for four seasons? And, you know, you did a lot of scenes with a lot of lines with. I mean, and he was, an, yeah. they said, an exceptional actor. Now, you know, I never understand. He's not the only one. I mean, I could name so many people who they didn't like the work they were doing, but yet the fans loved it. So I never understood why they hated it. But I mean, was it difficult when he left or do you think like uh, it was needed? Uh, I, it was only needed because his energy was such where he would kind of spread gloom. <laughs> but, yeah. um, however, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defend him as well and say that when he, when the cameras turned on or when we're rehearsing, he is as professional as anyone as and, and friendly uh, as anyone you, you wanted to meet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I always loved performing with him and doing scenes with him. He was a consummate professional, uh, but he didn't like the shows. And um, so was that was, later on or did he not like it from the start? I'd say from third or fourth season on. Right. So he was. I, a I, yeah. Years. I, I think he uh, he was he thought the show was going to be about a teacher and that really the classroom, the kids were like kind of one character, but then, you know, then the kids sort of took over and uh, the show, because I saw that's what the audience wanted. And he was not happy with that. Right. And, you know, the other person I compare him to, you know, you talked about being professional and stuff. I think a Robert Reed, he did not like playing Mike Brady on the Brady bunch. He hated it because he was more into yes. Shakespeare stuff. 
But one thing that you'll never hear any of those actors who played the kids on that show ever say that he was mean to them or anything. He treated them like a second father. So even though he didn't like the show itself or the write in yeah. or and, you know, he fought a lot with the producers, he really cared about those kids and, you know, the people he worked with. So, I mean, that's a credit to people like uh, Robert and Howard that they could still remain professional and never take it out on the cast members. Yeah, I would, I would say that as well. Yeah, Howard never, Howard would uh, battle with the producers, but uh, yeah, for for us, he would, he was there. Right, and you know, um, Dan, later on, you would do a great show called Keenan and Cal, and I think you did over sixty episodes on that show. I think it was on four or five seasons, and. Yeah. You know, your character, Chris Potter, was pretty popular. And that show was just funny. I mean, the, the, every time that show was on, you got to laugh out of everything. But what I think about that more than anything else is for a guy that started out, you know, being a magician, that was his first love. And then you got into acting. Think about this. You were on two successful series where you did nearly 200 episodes if you combine both uh, shows. And that's pretty remarkable. And you have to be proud of that because you were on two shows that are very popular. They're still popular to this day. I mean, Head of the Class has made a comeback. They've got an updated version of Head of the Class. So, I mean, you're part of something that's special and it's still going on all these years later. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I was um, Head of the Class. Actually, or the original Head of the Class uh, still plays on uh yeah, he runs on Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime, I believe. Prime, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one other two, Freevee, I think it's on Freevee. Freevee, uh, yeah. And then Antenna TV and such. Uh, so it does, it 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 does play. And then of course Keenan and Kel uh, pops up here and there. I I'm not, I don't follow it. So, but well, I you I can go on you you can go on YouTube and you'll just find. Well, you'll find it, yeah, and you'll find yeah. Team Nick and people buy the DVDs and such. Um, but yeah, I. I I felt uh, I've, I've been a, a, a lucky actor. Thank you. Yeah, really, you have been. And what I really admire about you is what you're doing now. Um, I got to check out some of these episodes, head of the senior class. And really what you're doing is you are now a senior citizen. So you're kind of going out there and meeting different senior citizens. And I really like, I think the last episode I watched, it was your childhood friend. And, you know, the fact that you two have remained friends for all this time is awesome. And I mean, I really do enjoy those shows. And I think I've only seen three episodes. Is that all that's airing? That's, right? that's, that, that's all we have so far. There is a fourth one uh, right. in the works, but and, and they're only like 10 or 11 minutes each. Um, but that started because I just wanted it. I was looking for an outlet. So um, I, I, I've produced, uh, produced those uh, myself, I hired uh, a wonderful producer, an editor, and a sound mixer, and uh, and then I've just got a website, headofthesenioorclass.com, that uh, just takes you to YouTube where the shows are, and um, just had fun with it. I did one from the, that we taped at the Magic Castle that you saw uh, with a yeah. a senior who was who she, who was a uh, professional clothing designer. Uh, and professional and successful, and she uh, and, and now she's a professional magician, and then a married couple who uh, has a bona fide um, Edison museum in their backyard. Um, so uh, I've been just having fun with that. I, I, I have one coming up with my brother. I'm not sure how long I'm going to do that for, but I'm really I really am enjoying it, and people are I'm, are enjoying it, giving me uh, good feedback. Yeah, and it's such a great title. I mean, that's really cool. You know, when I saw it ahead of the senior class, I was like, wow, this is really, uh, you know, innovative that you came up with such a cool name. It's almost like a tribute. it is a tribute to head of the class and you add the senior in there. But I really like what you're doing with that. And the thing is, too, Dan, is that what I think is probably the most fun for you is it's always hard to make it as an actor. You made it as an actor. You were very successful. Now you can kind of just have fun and do these different projects where you're not you know, desperate to find something. You're just yeah. doing something you really enjoy a lot and you yeah. get a lot of, you know, you get a lot of fun out of it and you get a great reaction from fans that didn't know who you were and fans that loved you. So, I mean, it's really cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it is gratifying uh, to hear from people and, and they would talk about the old show and, uh, you know, it's... Um, It'd be great if something else were to to come of it, but just as it's as uh, unto itself, it's uh, gratifying and fun. 
Right. So let me ask you, Dan. I mean, you did probably, I would say, 120 episodes ahead of the class. Is there one in particular that you enjoyed more than the others? Uh, probably two of them. One where I got to play Seymour, Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. Um, Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Because I, I, a couple of years before I auditioned for head of the class, I auditioned for the first Los Angeles company of Little Shop of Horrors. And they told my agent I was too young or I don't know, too something. Uh, so I didn't get it. But then cut to a few years later and there I was playing the role on television for uh, maybe uh, as many people saw it as maybe only came in second to uh, Rick Moranis from the movie. Right. Uh, so it was, uh, that was, uh, that was tremendous fun. And then uh, there was another episode um, called Arvid's Sure Thing uh, with an actress named a uh, guest star, Christine Elise, speaking of yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. memorable guest, uh, guest duties. Yeah. Where uh, she plays the, the school floozy and she decides that Arvid is her man of the week. And uh, so it's, you know, complications occur. And I actually have the scene in the pharmacy going to buy condoms uh, <laughs> for which we got special commendation from uh, Planned Parenthood. They actually gave it. I, I wasn't able to make it because I was hosting a, another a charity show, but they uh, had a dinner partially in our uh, in our honor. Yeah, I mean. Just tremendous TV, like I said, Dan. And the thing of it is, more than anything else, is it's got to make you feel good. I'm sure it makes Brian feel good. I'm sure it makes uh, Dan, uh, Robin, all those great actors that were on that show to know that they have a reboot of Head of the Class. Now it's a whole new group of kids. It well, I, I guess to tell you, Mike, that didn't last more than three or four episodes. That yeah. reboot. Uh, I actually, I, I was uh, had the honor of, of coaching a lot of these kids for their auditions, since I knew some managers who asked me to uh, to coach their their clients. Um, and then the show came on. I was very excited for them, just you know, for a new group of act, young actors to have their shot. Uh, and they put the show on HBO, I think, or HBO Max or whatever. Uh, I never actually, I read the script, but I never actually saw the show. Uh, but I, I think they pulled it after three or four episodes. So um, I think, though, Dan, they are going to, I mean, things I've read, they are going to try to resurrect it. Oh, I hope so. That sounds after, good. I hope yeah. so. But if they were to do that, I mean, I would love to see, number one, you guest star as Arvid. I think that'd be so cool. But I could also see you even, because you're not, you're pretty good at writing and directing. I could see you directing an episode, which I think would be awesome. And it'd be a nice tribute for you to be able to do something like that. I, I would love to. I am, I, I am in the director's guild. I, I, I directed a few episodes of uh, Sam and Cat. Yeah. With, uh, Jeanette McCurdy and uh, Ariana Grande. Um, so I, I'm, I, I've got my uh, shingle ready to go. <laughs> so Dan, um, before we go, what could we expect uh, going forward with uh Dan Frischman, like, what are you going to, what do you got upcoming for the year 2024 that we could look forward to? Well, I, uh, I want to continue, uh, perhaps making a few more of my head of the senior class, uh, shows. Uh, and I have a novel that is sitting with a, a literary agent in New York right now. That is a complete departure from anything I've done before. I have one novel actually in stores right now and on, on, on Amazon, um, for kids, that's a, co a comedic novel called uh, Jackson and Jenks, Master Magicians. Um, but I wrote a novel based in the Dracula world and it's it's uh, not a comedy, it's a dark Gothic drama about uh, Dracula's assistant from the original uh, book and movie, Dracula. Uh, his name is uh, Renfield. Right. Uh, there was just a comedy movie out with Nicolas Cage called Renfield, but this is not that Renfield. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so I, I, I'm really looking forward to, get, to getting that, uh, out there. Um, uh, and then just various other, various other, this, this, uh, I'd love to get this show sold somewhere, the uh, head of the senior class, of course, and, um, doing more, uh, magic elsewhere. Cause I kind of enjoyed doing that again and, um, like that doing more writing. And Dan, I really think this, and I know you're a few years older than, quite a few of the cast members. But one thing that I think would be cool for head of the senior class is to have something with you and Dan, because you and Dan are such good friends. 
like I said, the chemistry on the show you two had. I mean, I would definitely hope that we could see something like that. So that's a hint right there. Find okay. it. You know, that I'm, so cool. I'm writing that down, Mike. <laughs> that's a good but idea. Anyway, but anyway, Dan, um, I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes today. Uh, it was a real thrill for me. You know, a couple of my friends, when they knew you were coming on, they were so excited because, like I said, that character, Arvid, is still to this day, we're going on almost 40 years and he's still very popular. And that's a credit to you. That's a credit to the work that you put in, the dedication you had and, you know, everything you've done in TV and what you've done just to inspire people and impact people is really remarkable. And I really do thank you for giving me some time today. Mike, I appreciate your time and, uh, and thank you. <laughs> and you're welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. And folks, there you have it. You know, Dan Frischman's career has been over 40 years and what a remarkable career it's been. Like I said, it started when I saw him on Facts of the Life. That one episode left, a, like I said, a lasting impression on me. There was that episode of St. Elsewhere. To this day, when I see it, I still laugh. It's so wow. fun. And then he made us laugh for so many seasons on Head of the Class, which he's always going to, that's what he's always going to be known for. And that's not a bad thing at all. Because not a bad thing. <laughs> the character, Arvid, is a legendary character. He's somebody that, you know, one day they got to kind of put into the TV museum because that's how impactful he was. And that's a credit to Dan, the work he puts in and what he does each and every day. And we are so proud as fans to still see him working because he gave us so many memories. For In the Spotlight, I'm Mike Kenichi saying good night, everyone.